So I do want to welcome everyone to our session. Thank you for attending today. We are first off in this conference, which is very exciting. And we have a panel session today for you speaking about our COVID-19 lockdown reflections from our team here in New Zealand. And one note I just want to provide you before we get started is that this session will be recorded. So if for some reason you wouldn't like to be on that recording, you can turn your camera off, whatever you would like, but I just wanna make sure you know that we're recording this. So I am Patricia Hubbard and I'm a full-time professional teaching fellow and a part-time PhD student at the University of Auckland. And I've been teaching in business schools for about eight years between my experience in the US working in the state of Montana and New Zealand. And in my professional roles, I was previously a CFO and a business director in the US. And I'm a member of the organizing committee as well for this inaugural Oceania conference, which is very exciting. So today for our panel discussion, I'm joined by my three wonderful colleagues from the University of Auckland to talk about our reflections on remote teaching from last year, which we all experienced and all had to be very agile with our experience. And our program director, Andrew Eberhard, was also involved in the session development. He's not able to be with us today as he's on a much needed vacation. And so I do wanna recognize his contribution though to this panel and to our discussion today. So the four of us teach on a business master's program, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes. And we really want to talk a lot about how we only had a couple of days to convert our in-person courses online during the COVID-19 lockdown that occurred in New Zealand. So much of the world has watched how New Zealand has handled the COVID-19 situation. And we actually went into a fairly quick lockdown early last year. So we had about two or three days to convert our master's courses to online delivery, which was very creative and very interesting. So you'll hear about those experiences. So when we talk about this today, we really wanna focus on four themes. We wanna talk about our preparation, our delivery, our achievements and our challenges. And so please feel free throughout this session to ask questions, pop them into the chat as we go along, as we want this to be quite interactive and get your thoughts and get your experiences as well. So now I'd like to hand over to Deepika Jindal, who will begin by introducing herself as one of our panelists today. Thank you, Deepika. Um, thank you, Patricia. Hello, everyone. My name is Deepika. Um, I'm a professional teaching fellow at the University of Auckland. I um, have been teaching since 2014 at the university. I teach um, courses mainly related to human resource management and strategic management, although sometimes I do teach general management papers too. My research interests lie in the areas of work engagement, job crafting, and other HRM areas. Before joining academia, I worked in the industry for about a decade. It was a manufacturing organization, and I worked generally in the areas of um, strategy and um, kind of integrating with human resource management. Um, and apart from teaching and research, I also volunteer on the Auckland branch and academic branch of Human Resources Institute of New Zealand. And um, I'm really looking forward to sharing my um, experience of teaching during the lockdown with all of you. Thank you. Over to you, Hanako. Thanks, uh, Patricia and Deepika. And uh, good afternoon to all of you, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Hanoku Batula, and I'm a professional teaching fellow uh, at the Graduate School of Management uh, at the University of Auckland. And like Deepika, we had the experience of jumping into the um, teaching master's program in such a short period of time. But my background is from management and economics. And uh, I worked in the University of Auckland and other universities in, uh, in Auckland, like Massey briefly and Unitech and AUT. Uh, but then since 2013, I'm in the University of Auckland, the master's program. Uh, but in between, for a couple of years, I went to the industry, mainly worked in the healthcare industry, in both in the hospital and in a non-governmental organization. And I worked in the disability sector. Um, where I became a fellow in the ISQA, 
International Society for Quality in Healthcare from Ireland, and also a, a practitioner of PRINCE2 um, project management. And I came back to share my industry experience with my students. I mainly teach strategic management capstone course. I also teach a consumer be con uh, understanding consumers course. And so in fact, when last year, these are the two courses that I was able to be involved in offering during the um, shutdowns. Uh, that's main main background and hope to interact with you in the next one hour session or so. Singa, over to you. Okay. Uh, I, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Singa and you can feel free to call me Singa, which is easier. Um, I joined the graduate, uh, graduate School of Management in 2014 as a professional teaching fellow. And I think to being a teacher is kind of my family business because uh, four of my grandparents, they are all teachers and also my aunties and uncles and my mom, they are all teachers. And now I'm the third generation teacher. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm teaching economics, business analytics uh, usually. And the last year because of the COVID-19, uh, some, some changes for me. I also involved in teaching finance and also the global operational management. Thanks. Thank you, Deepika Hanoku and Singa. We're looking forward to all of your experiences. Great to know you have such a long generation of teaching experience, Singa. That's really interesting. <laughs> so what I'd like to do next is I'm just going to share a couple of PowerPoint slides just to give you a little bit of context. We really felt it was important in this session to be able to show you where we're actually teaching and the space we're teaching in to see how that can relate to our experiences as well as to what you could be doing with our experience. And so what I want to do is provide a little bit of context. We'll talk about those teaching strategies, those four themes that I talked about, and then we'll take some Q&A from the participants and I'll provide us a bit of a conclusion with some lessons learned that are from the committee. So when you look at our program and the way it's delivered, it's actually quite unique and that created some challenges for us, but also some opportunities during this lockdown. And so the coursework that we teach is in the master's program, as we mentioned, and it's designed for students with a degree in business or relevant discipline. And the classes are delivered across quarter systems. So instead of semesters, we teach across four quarters. And so most of us as professional teaching fellows teach all four quarters across the year. Year. And the program then takes students about 15 or 18 months, depending on which major they've chosen. So these courses are delivered over 10 week quarters. It's quite a rigorous program and the context moves quite quickly for the students. So we offer international business, management, marketing, professional accounting and human resource management, which as Deepika alluded to, is the program she primarily teaches in. So another thing in the context that we felt was important to provide for you today is this is actually what our program looks like articulated over six quarters. So this is our newest intake of students, which we call cohorts. And this is our masters of human resource management. So this is quite specific to those students. So they start off with two quarters of our core courses. So I've circled a few of the courses that the four of us teach throughout this so that you know when we're talking about our experiences, we may be referring to some of these courses. So then you see that they go on to start into their specialization of HRM into their third, fourth, fifth, and sixth quarters. So in the instance of the HRM, they are in the 18 month program, which takes them six quarters to complete. So for example, Singh is teaching in the economics, he's teaching in the analytics, Deepika and Hanuku are teaching in the HR policy and practice. And then I'm teaching in the HR analytics and the professional development, as well as Deepika is working with the students in a consultancy project towards the end of the program in their sixth quarter. So just really providing you that high level context of our program, since it is a bit unique unique. And one thing you'll hear us talk about as well is actually the delivery and contact time we have with these students. As I mentioned, it's quite a rigorous and intense 10 week program. So what that means is we see the students three times a week. So for example, in my human resource analytics course that they're taking in that fifth quarter, 
I see them on a Monday for an hour and a half long lecture, which we call a plenary. And then I would see them again, probably Wednesday for two hours for a tutorial session. And then I would see them again, potentially Thursday for a two hour TBL, which we call our team-based learning. So in one course for 10 weeks, they could potentially see us three times a week. So it's quite a rigorous program, five and a half contact hours per week they get with us over the 10 weeks. So that context is just a little helpful as we go on to talk about how unique those aspects come into our challenges. So we're going to jump right into our panel discussion here because I do think that's really where we want to spend most of our time today. So again, if you have any questions as we go along, please let me know in the chat, come up with those questions and I'll field those to the panel as we go along. So I want to kick off just by starting with our first theme, which is really around that preparation space. So when we were talking about this session, we came up with those four major themes of what we actually did during the lockdown conversion that we felt was really important and really brought us challenges as well as some key takeaways. And so in that preparation space, I wanted to start off by handing over to Deepika to just talk about what you did for that preparation piece that helped you in that conversion. Um, thank you, Patricia. What I will do is that I will talk about my experience in context of a particular course. And um, going back to that chart that Patricia showed to all of you. So I will talk about HR policy and practice, which is the first HR specialization paper that they take, which they study in their third quarter. So um, that paper, um, just two weeks before that quarter started, we went into lockdown. And so um, as Patricia said that there were certain advantages, which means we did have some um, two, two and a half weeks to be able to prepare. And um, before I talking about what I prepared for that paper, I would like to um, start with my own self because till that point, I had never ever taught online, never designed a course online. And being a job crafting um, researcher, and I thought that the crafting needs to begin with me. So, and I believe that unless I'm, I am myself engaged, my students cannot be engaged. So the first step was to engage myself in the process. So be, to, be, to be able to engage myself and the students by extension, I needed to craft my teaching to fit with what I knew, what I had to learn and also who I am. For that, I needed to use tools that I was aware of and also added some more tools to my toolkit. For example, Zoom, I was not at all aware of how it worked. So being a job crafting researcher, as I said, Earlier, I set about crafting my teaching to fit with my needs as well as my abilities. I took a couple of days to digest the fact that this was not going anywhere. I will have to teach online. The course had to be taught there and there was no way around it. So I had to first of all, create the right mindset for myself. So that was the first step in the preparation. And um, with respect to this particular course, HR policy and practice, the strategies that I adopted were a mix of conventional and non-conventional tools with a lot of guidance and support from university, the GSM Graduate School of Management colleagues, as well as I did a lot of experimentation too. What I did was I published the course on Canvas, which is our learning management system, two weeks, about one and a half to two weeks before it was to start and sent an announcement to the students describing key information on, on off-campus teaching. That is how the lectures, tutorials, and team-based learning se sessions will be run. So the document was quite detailed, about four pages long, and was meant to put them at ease and inform them that we had a workable plan to give them the best learning experience. In that document, I also mentioned to them that I have opened up a new discussion on Canvas and that Hanukkah, who co-taught the course with me, and I have posted our introductions there. In my introduction, I kept the tone very informal and I wrote a short story about who I am. So this set the context and before the quarter started, all 11 students had introduced themselves and quite interestingly, they all adopted the same informal tone that I used in my introduction. And I made a point to reply to each one of them and acknowledge what they had said about themselves, this did break the initial hesitation. Another thing that we did was launch a diagnostic survey, which I had created on Qualtrics. 
So in that, I asked them five questions to gauge their readiness level with studying HRM, since this was their first HR-related course in their specialization. So that provided us with an understanding of their knowledge level with respect to HRM, as well as the areas within HRM that they are most interested in. So just to summarize, three key things which helped before the course started. First is a welcome email. The second one, introduction through discussions on Canvas. The third one, diagnostic survey. Great, thank you, Deepika. And we do have a question from Carrie that I think is really good that I will address right now. So thank you for that. So thinking about our student profile and our population, generally our business master's students are international students. I think in some of our larger cohorts, which have been about 160 students, we've had maybe one or two domestic New Zealand students. So it's been quite rare that it isn't fully international students. And I think one of the unique things about our program as well is that the cohort sizes do vary a little bit. So sometimes we have, for instance, when I'm teaching professional development, I may have two or three streams. So they may be streams of 70 students. They may be streams of about 60 students that, that will be spending time with me throughout the week. So generally it varies. And Deepika, I don't know if you wanna share how large your HR policy and practice paper was, how many students were enrolled in there, but that might be helpful as well. Yeah. So as Patricia said that um, generally the um, cohort size is about 130 to 160 students overall. Then in the third quarter, they start picking up their specialization, which means they branch out into accounting, marketing, international business, and HRM. So on an average within these specializations, um, there are about 10 to 15 students. So I had 11 students for the HR policy and practice paper who was who had decided to specialize in HR and thus would be studying for the Master of HRM program. Perfect. I think the other important thing as well is that we intake our students twice a year. So in quarter two, which is approximately April and quarter four, which is approximately September, that's when we bring in our new cohorts of students that start working through their program. So when we say they're in their first quarter, it's probably actually quarter two or quarter four of the calendar year. So we, if we have larger cohorts of about 150, we may bring in 300 new students per year in to the program that are running then concurrently. So we typically have about three cohorts running at the same time. But as Deepika said, breaking off into those specializations is a really important component. So thank you for that. Thanks, Carrie. So now I want to go to Hanuko. If you could talk a little bit about your preparation as we led into that lockdown, that would be great. Yeah. Thanks, Deepika. And thank you, Patricia. Um, my preparation was, I think, twofold. Uh, first one was when we were thrown into the deep end of uh, teaching online and shut down. Um, I had to quickly learn about how to teach online using Zoom, which I have never ever used Zoom before that. Um, I've only heard of it. And then that became a main platform for teaching. And then I also needed to have um, equipment and you know, a laptop that is compatible and, and they, and they, and the earphones that are useful, I have never used them before. And that's when I started uh, using them. But I'm amazed at the way the university has supported us in the initial first two to three days when, say, when they knew that we we're going to go online, they've quickly set up a center where we were able to go and get a laptop, where the VPN is, uh, and, um, is set up there on the computer. So we could actually access our, our university folders from home. So that was very, very useful at the very beginning. So it means one is the technological technology preparation with the infrastructure necessary. And with that, we came and experimented. When we started experimenting to see if it works within our friends, we, when, with our colleagues, then we knew it, we could also contact and allow talk to students to deliver. The second part of the uh, preparation was in the area of uh, uh, the course, course material. Um, make, as Deepika mentioned, uh, making sure that all the details are given to students and they're understandable, they're simple, not too many complications. And so we had to provide, I mean, I say I, I was involved in two courses in that quarter, one with Deepika 
uh, teaching human resources uh, practice and policy. And the other one was I was also teaching a strategic, uh, cap strategic capstone course. And that course has about 95 students and it is applied course and students have to actually go and um, work on a project, take that company, expand into new, new market. And so it is a live project and, and all of them work on the same project. So it's hands-on experiential type. So therefore the, these two courses require two different kinds of uh, preparations. Deepika was able to get all the preparation done for human resources uh, policy and practice paper. Uh, I was only helping her, but I was also working on the other strategy capstone paper, uh, which required to uh, to be to be crafted in the way that students can understand because it's the first time they're doing experiential project um, in, in online and it, that is a doubly uh, challenging and what we have done as as Deepika mentioned gave all the information to students prior to the starting of the of the term because we had about a, a, a couple of weeks um, to know that we are going to teach online and so all the course outlines were available all the instructions were made available all the assignments for the whole quarter are made available to students so they can read, understand what to expect. But week by week, we are able to upload the PowerPoints and other reading materials. So students know at least one week to read. Otherwise, we thought it will be information overload to have everything else at the beginning. Uh, but we have we have given them enough material about the course outline and what the assignments and what to expect. So those are the two things that we have prepared. And also then we kept an open mind, me and my colleagues, uh, to engage with students informally, even before the term began. Um, so those are the two areas. One is technology, other one is course material that we were able to uh, modify it and keep things ready. Striking a balance uh, where we give enough information, but not too much information as the term started at the very beginning. Great, Tanoko. Thank you for that. And I think that strategy capstone is a great other perspective since it is such a big course. Mm -hmm. And that was a bit more to convert that online quickly. So thank you for that. And Singa, did you yeah. want to add on some of your experience from preparation? Yes, uh, thanks. I think uh, Deepika and uh, Hanaku had uh, covered a very comprehensive points. Uh, what I'm going to do is I just want to add some extra additional points according to my experience and the observations. I think that the first of all, as a part of the important preparation for teaching online is also, you have to think about uh, set up the Zoom meetings for students and how you want to set, set up it. Because we have, you know, as uh, Deepika and Hanako mentioned that we have lots of sessions per week, like a plenary tutorials, and the TBL sessions, and even like for me, for business analytics, we have an extra session called the lab session. So, you know, they have lots of sessions and also it's not, they are not only taking one course in the quarter. So they're taking three co uh, courses. And that's why if we all of us teaching online, then they are going to receive too many Zoom links. And I think it's really hard for them to manage. And that's why I think, according to my experience, I, 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 I'm, I'm happy to use my personal, you know, meeting ID. So, which means, you know, if students come to my economics class, they just need the one single link and it is working for plenary, for tutorial and for the TBL session. So, which I find is very helpful because, uh, you know, sometimes they, 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 they may just come not find the correct link and go to the net, uh, the, the run session. So that is uh, one point. Um, another one is um, to me also is very important because um, during last year, we had uh, two lockdown periods. And, uh, you know, I'm a single father. I have no other people to take care of my kids. And uh, what I'm going to do is I have to give some kids something to do while I'm teaching. So I have to make sure I got an adequate working environment, which, you know, I can be free of, of the uh, distractions, like uh, kids noise, like uh, fire alarms, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm living in the apartment. So sometimes when people smoking, the fire alarm is working, it's screaming, so it's a headache. Yeah, so actually, you know, there are lots of things I uh, ha have to prepare. Um, and also um, before the course starts, I, I communicate the early with uh, my students and also motivate them 
um, because on Canvas, there's a function called a page. It is, looks like a kind of announcement. So, but, but you can write a piece of a long message if you like, and also you can add graphs or charts and highlight some keywords. What I'm going to do with the um, page is I'm going to give like a, a, a teaching plan my plan for teaching and the, the students activities. So I'm going to list, for example, what I'm going to do in the plenary, what kind, what kind of the topic I'm going to cover and what are the uh, related reading lists for that topic. And also I'm going to list the, what, what we are going to do in the tutorial, in the TBL discussions, and also if we have any assessment, marked assessments in that week. So I think by doing so, the students can have a bird view of what we are going to do in a specific week. And I think it's quite encouraging students to pay attention, you know, to what we are going to do. Um, and also for economics and uh, business analytics, um, when I teach it, I, I also want to, you know, uh, in the um, team based learning sessions, especially, I, I also do a uh, pooling, which is kind of the multiple choice questions. So I preset the um, questions in the pooling function in Zoom. And then I can do the real time, you know, uh, quiz. And uh, it's very interesting to see how students, you know, pick up the answers. And, uh, you know, it's a kind of way for me to double check their learning progress. Um, the last one is about, you know, for me, sometimes uh, for teaching economics, I have to draw the graphs. So um, I fortunately, um, I got a second screen. Uh, the, the iPad, so you know, I and also I create a dummy account for Zoom, so I can join the my own Zoom meeting as a student, so I can see you know how what what the students can see from the screen, and to make sure you know I I show the proper contents, yeah, and everything's working. Thanks. So that's my part. Thanks, Zinga. I think you bring up a lot of really good points in each of your discussions where there's a lot of practical things that we needed to think yeah. about in the preparation as well. It yes. wasn't just about how do we deliver analytics or HR. It's also in we needed headphones. We needed to know how to use Zoom. We needed to know <laughs> how to manage the links and all of these things. How many times have we been on Zoom meetings now where someone doesn't appear and they say, oh, I was in some other room or some other link that who knows where they are out in the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Singa, when you were talking about the different links, Angela put in a comment about using Adobe Connect Room, which I think is really interesting, that oh, all of the right. tutors use that space for their workshops. So there's only one link to share, which I think is brilliant mm. oh, that's and great. is really yeah. helpful. Yeah. And what I ended up doing was I was using my unique link for Zoom. And the flaw in that is people were coming in all the time and so you couldn't really stop them of course the waiting room helps with that now but it was very difficult to sort of have this open room space it was like having open office hours and they were just popping in yeah. and out so you couldn't yeah. really have conversations with some of the students or have classes back to back as everyone was coming in and out so very interesting challenges yes and yes. i think one of the other things one of you mentioned that the university support was really good and we were very fortunate that they mobilized that quickly. I think mm -hmm. the other thing was our leadership within our department for the business masters was very strong in that even our director, Andrew, who again, I mentioned couldn't be here today. He had a morning check-in at 9 a.m. every morning. It was just a half an hour. He put a Zoom link on everyone's calendar. You could come if you wanted. You didn't have to come. Some mornings he was there. Sometimes it was just us. And it was just a good opportunity to check in if we had any questions or anything we wanted to run by each mm -hmm. other. Also, if there was any great ideas we had that we could share in that space. And I think that was really nice to keep us connected when we were all feeling quite isolated as many people were. So I think that was really important in our preparation too. Great, thank you. So I do wanna move on to our second theme, which is in the realm of delivery, because obviously that's very important for us teaching and how we actually enforce those strategies as we went along. So Deepika, did you wanna kick us off again? Yeah, sure, uh, Patricia. So um, once the quarter started, I kept the communication very simple, clear and transparent. Every Friday, I released what is going to happen the next week. 
And as part of that information, I released a 15 to 20 minutes recorded lecture, lecture notes and PowerPoint slides. I also released the tutorial scenario that they would be working on along with questions that they had to answer, as well as what would happen during the team-based learning session, that whether there is going to be a case discussion, whether there will be a guest speaker, whether I have got any debate planned for them. Then I used in the next week, the actual week, I used the actual lecture time as question and answer session over Zoom with the assumption that they would have watched um, the lecture video and they would have gone through the readings and the notes. And I started the lecture with a quiz on Zoom, similar to what Singha mentioned. And it took about 10 minutes and I was able to um, assess their understanding of the topic, share the results with them. And then we had discussion on quiz questions. And during that time, I provided them further examples and then they had the opportunity to clarify content. So rather than using the lecture time on Zoom to lecture, I used that time for discussion on the lecture content. And um, during the actual tutorial time, Hanako provided them feedback on the answers they had written on the scenarios. And this was done. So the discussions um, feature on Canvas. And uh, the TBLs were conducted through Zoom and every week was different with a mix of case studies, role plays, debates, and guest speakers. We used breakout rooms extensively to do this. And we organized two guest speakers from the industry and they were there on Zoom um, to share their presentation, to talk to the students about that particular topic. And thus the students actually got to um, connect with the industry um, speakers, which they would have ordinarily done during the quarter in the in-class um, room experience as well. We conducted our office hours through the live question and answer feature of Piazza. And so we used a mix of synchronous and asynchronous methods to teach the course. So Piazza, Zoom, Canvas, email, and a lot of Google documents. For example, during the breakout rooms, they would have a Google document ready and they would all type um, their discussion points in it, which could be then shared later on. Another thing that I would like to mention is that at the beginning, um, we understood that they would have a need for connection. And in order to break the barriers more with them, we organized a movie night for them at the end of first week. Um, seven out of 11 students came, so that was good. And I know I spent many hours the previous week trying to find a movie that I could show them without breaking any copyright laws over Zoom. I finally managed to find a movie through the university website, which incidentally was called The Mask. So remember Jim Carrey and Cameron Diaz? And believe me, there was no pun intended when we showed a movie with that title. But it was only one I found that was worth showing and did not infringe any copyrights. And we showed it on a Friday night. We all got our drinks and the students absolutely loved it. And I think that made them a little bit more relaxed. And I had never taught those set of students before. So it just kind of um, made us more connected with each other. So those are the different things um, that I used along with Hanako for um, delivering this particular paper. Thank you, Deepika. I think it's a really good point about the social aspects because I found mm -hmm. that as well. I'm fortunate that I teach these students over four quarters, which is quite unique. Most times we only see them once, but I actually have them for an entire year because our professional development courses run alongside their courses for the first four quarters, which is their first year. So I knew quite a few of the students, which I think did make a difference to already have that relationship. But you're right, building that relationship in that environment was completely different. And I also, I appreciate you talking about the live office hours and how you held that because I was doing office hours for my undergrad larger courses. I did one hour office hours on Zoom and one is the loneliest number when you're holding Zoom office hours live and nobody comes to see you. It's very sad. Or they come in, they see they're the only one and they leave. That's also very sad. So I think that idea of having that live with the Q&A is a really good idea and really good way to do that. So I did see that Angela popped in a question. Angela, I wondered, did you want to unmute and just clarify for me a little bit what you mean by engaging internal learners? And then I'll see if maybe Deepika wants to weigh in on how she engaged those students. 
Yeah, so I think it's um, the internal students, the students who normally would study on campus and weren't used to being distance learners. So um, you probably know with Massey University, we have a large distance cohort. So the shift online for us wasn't, as teachers, a, a massive issue. Um, it was already there. It was set up. We just had to get the internal students to show up and be active in that online space. Um, and a lot of the internal learners weren't. They didn't like um, the flexibility, not having to be in a class for those two hours. Um, and they just didn't show up and didn't respond to emails and didn't respond to um, other ways of getting hold of them. So we lost, I don't know, a good third of students mm. who just stopped showing up. Um, right. No matter what strategies we tried to get them to come back. So just interested if you had similar problems or and, mm. and how how we kept them there. And I guess you've got postgrad learners, I've got first year undergrads, so quite a different cohort. Um, right. In terms of motivation <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But yeah, we just had a, a, a group, very small group, because a significant group who disappeared. Mm. I think that's a really good point. So last year I was teaching on the master's program for our, these students that we're discussing, but in semester two, I also taught our undergrad students when we went into the second lockdown. And you're right, it was a different perspective because our master's students, since they come from international places, it's a very high touch program, seeing them three times a week. They came for the on-campus experience. That's why they're here and that's why they chose our program. So I I think it was quite a dramatic change for them because it's not what they signed up for and it's not what they were expecting. It's not what they came to New Zealand to experience where I found my undergrad students that are mostly domestic New Zealand students were actually okay switching to online and they actually took it pretty well. You're right that a few of them kind of disappeared and we were chasing them a little bit to see where they had gone in the virtual space. But I do think it was different for our masters. They had a harder time with that conversion. And Deepika Hanuko Singha, do you have anything to add to that? Any other thoughts? You mean for the delivery? For as far as the strategy of ours being converted to online. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, so I had a different experience um, um, with uh, my students. There's a smaller class, there is a bigger class. And usually the dynamics change when we go from small to the large ones. And also depends on the discipline and the subject that we teach. Uh, so that it makes a difference. But I agree with um, Patricia, who when, when she said that our students actually come for um, the experience of interacting with students now all most of them about 80 percent of them international students they learn about the culture try, try to work together and in fact some of them actually live in the university building practically they come in the morning they stay there they have their lunch they have their meetings and the team meetings that we put them into together they continue even outside the classroom and they go to the collapse and come back that experience suddenly disappeared and that actually affected our students very badly. Yes, I agree. And as well as since most of our students, English is a second language, hmm. they really missed out on that experience of being on campus in the business school with us, engaging with other students, engaging with yeah. us. I yeah. do think they had a lot harder time with it than a lot of students. So I think yeah. that's a great point, Angela, that I think our students struggled as well. Uh, another problem with our students was they are lonely here. They didn't even have friends to talk to. They were stuck in their own rooms. They don't have family. They don't have friends to talk to. And that actually really impacted them. And I think the other thing is our students really look forward to the two-week break between the quarters to go home mm -hmm. and go see their families refresh. And since they couldn't leave New Zealand and do that, I felt like they really did struggle quite a bit, as well as over the Christmas break not being able to leave, that I think that affected they didn't really come back refreshed like they normally do. And um, yes, Angela, you're absolutely right that um, I think that's one of the things we will discuss under the challenges um, part that we saw the attendance dropping midway after the quarter, mm -hmm. because that's when their assignments started building up that added to the pressure. And so rather than being on Zoom with our, interacting with us, they thought it's better for them to spend more time on their assignments. Mm -hmm. I, I will uh, just share a couple of things from um, the, my course, the course that I taught, Strategy Capstone, um, as with regard to delivery part of it. 
uh, I was lucky to experience uh, teaching a, a smaller class and also the bigger class, large class. Um, I, I will not add more to what Deepika mentioned with regard to human resources um, policy and practice, which she explained very well. And uh, she has put in a lot of thought to get the course um, delivered properly. I did not realize at that stage, but later on, based on my experience with Deepikana, we consulted almost every day of what we can do better for the course and how we can deliver it well. And I was looking at a comment by Associate Professor of uh, Harvard University, Ailet Israeli, who actually mentioned, keep it simple and practice as to the teachers and plan for less, and but be fully prepared with all the resources required. So if Zoom doesn't work or if uh, poll doesn't work, if uh, something else doesn't work, be prepared to somehow make sure that the course is delivered well, make it simple and practice it. So I think that's what Deepika has done in, in, in when I reflect on what uh, the course, how the course was delivered. But there's also another course that I was involved, uh, the strategy capstone course where students are required to work on a, pro on a company, take that from New Zealand, and take it abroad to any country into a new market. And the topic that we had was um, uh, a company from New Zealand going to Australia. So like in any strategy, they had to do internal uh, environment scanning, external environment scaling, and also then look at the problem identification, come up with solutions, and then uh, compare them, alternatives, etc. So this cannot be done by students by giving with few suggestions from teachers. They needed to be handheld, they need to be consulted, they needed more time. And that makes it very difficult when there's a large class. In, in a, on a campus-based class session, students actually, mature students in a group would help each other out. They, 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 they become teachers, peer, peer uh, teaching takes place. But when they're sitting in their homes, that possibility is reduced and therefore they're a bit lost initially. So we had to still make students come to the class and create about 15, 20 breakout rooms. And me and my colleague were going from one breakout room to another breakout room. And in some places, lo and behold, we saw them simply staring at the computer. They're not talking at all. And then we had to go there and say, hello. And then they would come on live and remove their masks to talk to and say, what are you doing? Because they didn't know what to do. They were not talking. Um, and therefore, uh, we then tell them, can you do this? Can you do that? And then after the whole workshop is over, I ask them, each of you, please send me a couple of lines of what you discuss as an email. When those emails came, I put them together into one single document and uploaded them back on Canvas. So students could see what are the main ideas of internal environmental scanning or what is the outcome of external environmental scanning or who are the potential consumers, et cetera. So those details they could see without the names being um, mentioned, uh, different ideas that they could grapple with and work on for the next, next uh, the following week. So that's one major change um, we brought in during the um, during the, uh, the the online teaching, and the second one was basically we did not make many changes on Canvas because students always had the um, resources uploaded to Canvas. That is not a big change. Uh, they all also submitted their assignments on Canvas. That did not change. What changed was when there was a test that made a big difference because we used to have a secure test, but the secure test is no longer possible when students do it work, work from home. Uh, first time we never had that experience that university gave 24 hour window uh, for uh, the course to be down, the, the a test to be downloaded and um, again uploaded after 24 hours. Whereas, and, and then the teacher, I think Deepika was in that role. She was there for the first one hour to be available for students to ask questions and one hour again before they submit in the last one hour after 23 hours. And we also had, but the, whereas the second lockdown when we had, I think that 24 hour window was reduced to just 30 minutes extra to normal time. And uh, we that's how things have changed. Obviously we learned and students also learned how to use the time, time well. Um, so these are the um, major changes of our delivery, but we had to end up spending a lot of one-to-one -one time with the students outside the regular um, plenary session, outside the workshop one or tutorials and workshop two, which we call TBL. Because there's a larger class, we had to spend one-on-one -on -one time outside those even three sessions as well. And 
um, unex not expect not surprisingly some students have dropped down or not showing up regularly and then we had to ask our um, uh, professional team and managers team uh, to follow up what is happening with them and we also used to send an emails to them can you please come and contact us and there will be always some issues like i don't have a proper a computer in my home or my facilities at home are not suitable and things like that. So we would encourage them and uh, to read the resources available. So it was basically the informal relationship to strengthen and support the formal course delivery material that we had. I definitely think I noticed that as well, that the one-to-one -one became very important, that students were requesting one-to-one -to, -one to clarify things. And I also think your point about the prompting questions when they were in breakout rooms, I made that mistake right from the beginning. I put them into breakout rooms and just gave them a task to do. And as I was popping around, they were just staring at each other. Mm -hmm. And so I finally learned that I needed to give them some sort of prompting questions to guide them along. And that was something that they could actually go through and concrete answer and discuss mm -hmm. and otherwise you're right without our guidance and our mm -hmm. teaching and that kind of experience they weren't really knowing which direction to go so mm -hmm. i think that's a really good point we put a big question on the slide and then said this is the question you'll be discussing it in different <laughs> rooms you have what about 30, 20 minutes or 30 minutes exactly that's perfect <laughs> okay singa did you have something you wanted to add to our delivery discussion please Yes, uh, I, I actually, uh, I just want to add some minor points uh, because uh, also I found that teaching online is quite uh, challenging, you know, probably is, an, uh, is also a part of the challenging part. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, it's not like a usual classroom teaching. Sometimes, you know, when they come to the Zoom meetings, they, they stop video, they, they mute themselves. So it looks like I always talk to myself and I can't see anybody <laughs> in the room. So I, I actually, I really hate this. And I try my best to encourage my students to show their face uh, because, you know, sometimes when I teach economics or, you know, some statistics, some concepts could be very compli uh, complicated. And, and uh, you know, in the usual classroom, when I walk around the room, I can see their face to tell you they feel, oh, it's easy or feel it is hard. But, but you know, when we teach online, sometimes it's, it's not working anymore. So that's why I have to repeat every time, oh, can you, can you follow me or something? But, but, you know, if they can show their face, then I can see most of them, okay, have a happy face. Then, you know, I can keep going. Otherwise, I just repeat again. But, but I think one of the advantage that offered by online teaching is, for example, like a Zoom, we can, we can see their name, at, at least the username, easily. So sometimes, you know, one of my students, uh, he, he's really like a fishing and a fish. So he call himself fish. And every time just call him to answer some questions. And, you know, students always find, uh, find it really interesting and fun. And I also randomly pick up students from my screen to ask them some questions. So which can increase their attention to what, what I'm talking about. So this is one point. Um, and another one is I think because uh, teaching online is sometimes is uh, maybe it's not like a really like a classroom. So probably students need some breaks. So I offer breaks about uh, maybe like five minutes and I show, you know, a timer come down video mm. for five minutes because I don't want them to change the channel. <laughs> so, <laughs> and also know, you know, uh, how long is the break last? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also sometimes um, I, I utilize the break, five minutes break to show them a home workout video. So it's like doing exercises, you know, because students during the lockdown, they probably just uh, stay home and have nothing to do. I think probably doing some you know, uh, physical exercises could be good for them. So this is what I've done. Um, and also for teaching economics um, and also, you know, like the global operational management. Sometimes I have to draw the graphs to show them, for example, like a normal distribution and, you know, the Six Sigma series something, which is really hard to teach online because um, I think the cursor is not really attractive and it's not really clear, you know, moving the cursor. So that's why sometimes I have my own physical whiteboard 
that is what I'm using to teach my kids at home, but now I can use it to teach online. So I use my physical whiteboard and use my body language sometimes. And, and I think students quite like it. <laughs> this is my experience. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Inga. That's really great. I think you bring up a really excellent point as well in the passive and kind of active learning. It's definitely more difficult for us to tell if they've just turned their cameras off and they're doing something else or like you said, changed the channel on us. That's definitely something that you're going looking at all these black screens going, is anyone even listening to me or am I just talking to myself? <laughs> And so I think the other really good point you made is about the names. That was really helpful for me in my bigger course. So I had about 75 students in one of my streams. And when one would ask a question, it was great because it would pop up and I could say, oh, Deepika, did you have a question? Where actually in the physical classroom, when those students are new to me, I don't know all of their names yet. And that was really nice that we had that personal and again, building those relationships just through some of those experiences was really good. So a really great points. Thank you, everyone. And so I do want to move on to the achievement section, because I think the achievements and challenges is a really important takeaway for all of us and a really good discussion. So Deepika, did you want to start us off talking about some of your achievements from your courses? Um, sure, Patricia. I'm not sure whether um, I will be able to call them achievements, but those were some of the aha or the moments where um, I felt that perhaps things were going um, well and they were not in dire um, state. So one of the reasons I think students were quite comfortable early on was the connection that we made with them by engaging with them even before the quarter started through those introductions that we had on um, the discussions feature of Canvas. So we knew each other's story very briefly. And in fact, we followed the same system throughout the quarter. Um, we only made one announcement every Friday, providing information on next week's content. That was the only announcement we sent during the week and avoided sending any other email during the week. We also consciously decided not to send any emails after 6 p.m. or during weekends, unless the students initiated it. Then we replied. We didn't over communicate with them. And I think they liked that fact. And because the lectures and the TBLs were on Zoom, so students did have a lot of contact um, time with us. The students really liked the personalized emails that um, we sent them halfway through the quarter. So what I did was I looked at their attendance in lectures and TBLs, their participation in Canvas discussions for tutorials, what they had mentioned in their introductions before the course started. And then I crafted individualized emails highlighting their high moments and suggesting where they needed to focus more on and also putting in um, their performance up to date on their different assignments. Perhaps I could do this because it was a small class. It could even work with some more numbers, but perhaps it may, may get difficult beyond a certain class size. And uh, coming back to, um, you know, Singha's point, he said that economics is tough to teach online. I totally agree, but I think we didn't have that problem with HR because HR could be made um, very interesting with um, lots of case studies and people have their own experiences. Everybody who was there on the course had worked at some point previously. So because it was a people management course, so what we did was we encouraged them to connect the content with what they had or were experiencing in their work lives to understand the content better. For example, if it was a week on recruitment and selection, so um, I would encourage them to share their stories on their own recruitment experiences, what they observed. And because they are international students and they have come from different um, countries, different back cultural backgrounds. So it was very interesting to see that how the same HRM function could be viewed from different lens. And that's what made it interesting. So unless, unlike economics, perhaps we didn't have that kind of a problem. And again, Angela, coming back to what you asked um, earlier about the strategies. So perhaps um, this was one of the strategies we used and we could use it in an HRM paper. And if it was learning and development, so the questions or the activities would be around what makes you learn best? Or what is it that your organization provided you previously in your work life, or if you're working current, currently, 
what is the best thing that you liked, how they taught you something or the exposure that they gave you. We talked a lot, lot about, for example, uh, mentors or coaches, different kinds of, so you know, it, it could be brought to life because of their own life experiences. So that is what worked. Um, they, I think they enjoyed the varied activities that we offered in the team-based learning sessions. And um, in, in an in actual class, they would always get to meet and interact with people from industry. And even um, we were online, we still brought that experience. So we had guest lectures who came in on Zoom and talked to them about the different topics. And um, so I think that um, these were the things that really helped them, keeping the communication simple, to the minimum, encouraging them to connect the content with their life experiences, personalizing the emails that we sent them, and keeping the TBLs interesting to different activities and um, making it quite varied. I think the personalized emails is a really, really nice touch. And I think they did appreciate that. And I think you make a good point about scalability of that. And I know the university introduced us to a program called On Task that actually integrates with our LMS and could send personalized emails out to larger groups. It's like a mail merge. And so it would merge out and say, dear Patricia, just checking in that it's the middle of the semester and here's where your marks are. And the only flaw in that is the students know then that it's a system, not a personalized. So it's sort of that balance of we do have that luxury in some of the smaller courses of actually being able to personalize them, which I think the students do really appreciate. And I think it can't be said enough to not over communicate. And I think in the chat, Carol and Angela are talking about that as well, that we definitely had message overload, that we were getting things from the vice chancellor, we're getting things from the prime minister and health ministry, and everyone was sending messages to the staff and informing everyone, you know, as New Zealand as a whole, as the university, as faculty in our department, and we were just getting so many communications as were the students. And I think it just got to a saturation point where we couldn't possibly read anymore. There were sometimes I would get a very lengthy email and I just couldn't read it. I just needed the highlights. I, and I know that's how our students felt as well. So I think I definitely mm. heard from those students that you had that they appreciated that minimal communication. Mm. It was They knew it was only coming if it was important once a week, very consistent. And they really liked that. And I think, yes, Angela, definitely getting all those messages and trying to understand what needs to be done. And the students were going through that as well. So I think that's a really excellent point. So Hanuku, do you want to add anything to those achievements? Yeah, yes, I think uh, Deepika explained very well about uh, HR course. I'll just mention about um, the other strategy course that I was involved. Uh, first thing is I will endorse what Deepika mentioned, making a shorter and more focused lecture was very, very useful. Um, using traditional courses did not were not really good because it's difficult to engage students' attention for such a long time on, on uh, Zoom for one and a half hour or two hours and three times a week is very, very difficult. So we have learned as a teacher, I have learned as a teacher, the pedagogy, what works, what doesn't work. So one of the learning is to keep it very short, simple, straightforward, thinking of what are the takeaways that I want my students to, to go with. So if I put myself in that position, then I can reverse engineer and come back and say prepare in a way that they can take away useful stuff. Uh, what, what technology tools that I could use, a Piazza, a, a Mentimeter and polls that I have not been exposed to before. That is, and I won't call it achievement, I'll call it learning in, because of this experience. And also how to engage students online using different teaching methods for different uh, um, uh, courses that I teach or different aspects within the course that we teach require different approaches when using online and also need to be up I mean I have learned to have more sympathy and empathy for students who are also in a similar situation like I was sitting at my home and so I had to learn how to motivate those who are actually not actually involved identify them and then encourage them and reach out to them to find out some people actually said my house is so bad I don't have any people to support me um, and no one actually to remind me that I need to wake up because they lost sense of time they're just staying at home 
Uh, and then the uh, third aspect is the interaction started off very well in the first few uh, weeks. And then the students who used to talk always kept talking and students who kept quiet, they stayed behind the mask and it was difficult to reach out to them. So I made conscious effort to identify those students who are not talking at all and to encourage them and say, hey, if anybody has not asked questions the last two weeks now, I want you to ask questions, not those who asked previously. So that will force them or, or give an opportunity for them to involve them. So the engaging students was very, very useful. Unless they talk, we can't actually help them. So those are three major learnings. You know, as a teacher, what kind of pedagogy? Second one is what tools I can use. Third one, how to engage students are my learnings, which I can call it as achievements. And I think one thing that we really did well as a program, and you and Singa have alluded to this, is really that time management for the students. And I'll talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about that as our takeaways. But I think the point of kind of that balance between your life in your home and what was going on there was really impacting their learning, which normally, mm. like you said, they show up to the business school for very long days and they stay there, they're focused. They didn't have that. Mm. And so we were really trying to balance a lot of that. And I think we did that really well. So I see that as an achievement for our program because we all talked and communicated almost daily. Mm. And like Singa said, if they have two or three courses running side by side, we were generally speaking to each other and saying, what do they have to do next week? Are they a bit stressed? What's happening? And I think we helped in that time management as part of kind of our achievements as well. Yeah, just one one comment. Um, Andrew has given us that opportunity to catch up every day in the morning and which we used to share and share our experiences to say what worked well and what did not. So our colleagues could go and use them in their courses, number one. Number two, we had a community of practice presentation session in between, again, our, our colleagues could share what went right. And so it is more of a learning even while we're delivering it and then making those adoptions and changes quickly, uh, reflecting on our action in the past and also reflecting while the action is going on uh, was very useful as a concept and we could use it in, our, in the delivery. Yes, definitely. I think that's an excellent point. So Deepika, I see Angela just popped a question and I wonder if you wanted to weigh in a little bit on that. Did you feel that the learning was as deep for the students? Because you've taught these courses multiple times, you've taught on other different courses, that do you think they were doing the bare minimum to get by if you were posting videos and discussion and PowerPoints? Or do you think they were clicking through everything, just doing the assessments? I think that's a really good point that I do feel like when I've taught online only courses in the past in the US, sometimes the students, you can see their track of history of they've clicked right through to the quiz and they didn't watch anything in between, didn't look at any of my material in between. So did you get the feeling that they were engaging in all of that? Um, I would say that um, some of the students were really engaging in depth with all the content. But then all of them were going through it. And another part of simplicity of communication was simplicity of how the course was designed. Apart from um, the compulsory textbook that they had, there were only two additional readings that they had to go through every week. And one of those were practitioner-based um, reading on what's happening in the um, practical world rather than only coming from a theory point of view about that topic. And um, another thing is the assessments. Um, the assessments that we had, um, so we did have a test, but then that was not a theoretical, it was based on scenarios. So they had scenarios, so they had to apply their understanding. So it was not enough for them to wrote, learn something, but they had to read through that HRM scenario and be able to apply what it meant. So we used, we tried to use a lot of um, authentic assignments. And then um, one of the assignments was case study based, which was their final one. And they had a case. And based on that case, there were few um, questions that they had to answer. So that was different from scenario, which was just a paragraph long case was about two and a half to three pages long. And then another of their assignment was the best practices, for example, that um, another com other companies um, would have used um, related to a particular HRM area. And then they had a list of some global companies. So um, we could see that they were understanding the content 
and that they were able to apply it. Oh, yes, of course, there was a variation where some students were able to do it really well. And we could see some of them um, struggling perhaps and not doing well. So like um, there would be some who would sit in the B or the B minus range as well. Now, whether that was because they were not fully engaging with the content or whether it was just their general engaging but not understanding of the content mm -hmm. so that uh, were the other two factors which were there in but yes i think because the readings were not too many um so they did engage a lot but i think there was a drop towards the end two or three weeks mm -hmm. of the quarter Right. And like we talked about, maybe towards this bigger assessment time, once they've built up all that content mm -hmm. and knowledge, that was when they really hunkered down to focus on their assessments. Maybe the attendance wasn't as good. I think I'll add to that, though, your last point, Angela, where you said you got a lot more questions in your workshops. That was definitely my experience with the undergrads. So my 200 undergrads, there's a lot of content that we throw at them for that first business course. For example, one week might be on business ethics, but there's a lot of reading. So unlike what Deepika said, where she was very concise, gave them that, we give them a lot of reading, a lot of resources. So I did find with them, when we got into the workshop setting, they were asking questions about things that they should have already known and should have already done in the pre-work but obviously mm. had not so a lot of times what I would do which maybe might be might be a little mean of me is I would just redirect them if I had one student in that class that said well what about this and I don't understand this concept I'd say oh did you go and read chapter 10 that we posted mm. for you and I'd send them the link and kind of redirect them so that they knew all of that was available and there for them. They just hadn't quite made it through all that prep material yet. Because we had a structure in the undergrads of we had pre-workshop material that they needed to do before they saw us live. And you could definitely tell when they hadn't done it. You're right. They're asking those questions and you know those answers have already been out there. So I think that's a good point. Hanoku, did you have something I, you wanted to yeah, add? Yeah, I just wanted that. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Patricia. Wonderful. Almost a similar approach is what I have taken in the strategy caption course each week we required students to work on an assignment or a small um, aspect um, like a like a block uh, towards uh, the bigger project later on but when they had questions we used piazza to answer the questions the canvas is to give them the assignments and the main issues and the class discussion we moved them to a piazza platform and so when there's a question so where do you find the resources somebody would ask and the question is there and we give an answer and students could go and find these answers there so they don't have to each we, we don't have to re answer the same question to all the people so there are questions and answers about 10 different questions um, so that was uh, quite useful the actual exercise is on on canvas and say identify, do excellent analysis, you know, with lots of instructions, and this is the cutoff date, and this is how many words you have to give, and these are the topics that you need to cover. But the supporting was provided in Piazza. Where do you get the information from? What is the website name? Uh, what are the questions? What aspects would you look at? And also encourage students to um, comment, and they could help each other out. Thank um, you Carol, for answering um, Carol's question, yeah. Deep yeah, and Carol, another thing that um, we could use Piazza is for voting. I mean, unlike in a class where we, you would ask them that would anyone want to be a class rep? And if there are more than one people, they would raise their hand and you would do a quick voting. And because we were online, we used Piazza for that um, voting because on Piazza, you can actually set up a poll and students could vote and they could and they could even vote for more than one person if you've got a bigger class and you want to choose two reps. And so you could, you know, allow them just to vote once or more than once. So Piazza could also be used for things like that. It can also be used um, for quizzes, although I use Zoom for quizzes and not Piazza. But I think if you want any kind of voting or anything, it, that's another thing you could use. Mm -hmm. And I primarily used Piazza last year for that really peer sharing, like Anuku talked about, where generally in 200 students, if one has a question, quite a few have the same question. So being able to put all of that there, they're getting those updates, they're seeing that I can refer back to other queries, I can post links to things within Canvas. So I mostly used Piazza for that communication piece and just one more way for them to be in touch with each other and with me. So that was my primary use of Piazza. So can Sina, did you have, oh yes, please. So when you have 
you use Canvas and then you have Piazza. Are they running simultaneous so that yes. students can be maybe looking at a lecture or listening or something and having conversations on the side? Not, not on the or same class session, but once the class session is over, they'll go and then use it. Okay. And the Piazza so you, is embedded in Canvas. So the, when they open their Canvas, the Piazza is embedded. For example, if there are a whole lot of features about modules, about discussions, so you could also add Piazza as one of the applications there. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. But And you could use Piazza for live discussion. I know there are yes. some people that do that. You can, because you'll see live who's replying yeah on what's happening in that conversation. So students potentially could use it live. I've never yeah. done it myself, but I know some people do. And then I used it for my office hours. Mm. Yeah. And the thing I liked about using it for my office hours too, was that I had tracked what questions student had. So yeah. I could compile those for these were the main questions that you had about the upcoming assessment. Maybe some of you have these questions. So then I could share that out with all of them. And I had that kind of record of what had been asked so that I could sort of send an update out to students to make sure I'm answering their questions. And so Singa, did you have anything to, thank you, Carol. Thank you for that question, it was wonderful. And Singa, did you have anything else you wanted to add to our challenges section or just that conversation in general we've been having with Angela and Carol's questions? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, one of my observation is also, uh, I, I want to uh, contribute to the answers is like, uh, because you know, for the campus, we, we can download all the students um, access data. So we can see, you know, we post something there and we can see who didn't really open the link or who didn't really read it. So. And, and also, like Deepika said, uh, she had uh, designed a uh, individualized feedback. And I think uh, we are quite uh, fortunate uh, at Auckland Uni because we got a system called uh, Own Task. So we can actually customize the individualized uh, feedback for like 1,000 students, you know, <laughs> or, you know, for, for us, we just need to do for about 100. 20 or 30 or 60 students. Yeah, so I have uh, tried to use the uh, students access data. And then, you know, I send the individualized email to all the students say, hey, you, I found out you haven't checked, you know, you haven't read this article or something. So I think the students have been really surprised, you know, because uh, they find out that the, the, the lecture um, designed 160 emails in one night and they know, <laughs> They are access, you know, they 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 define out the lecture, know their access <laughs> information. So I think they will be very interested and uh, uh, shocked actually. And I actually I found once I've sent the first email, then I think that the um, you know their access the the rate is getting higher and they they start to read something that I post on Canvas. Yeah, and, and, and I think, it, and, and also like uh, challenges, a part of the challenge like uh, many of you mentioned that is um, the message overload or, you know, I, I, I call it information overload because uh, like before in the classroom teaching, we are giving handouts, the hard copies. And I think the students can achieve it or, you know, they, they know what we are going to do or something. But uh, when we totally teach online, then there's no handouts at all. So students have to find which information are helpful or they have to find answers sometimes. So I think it totally depends on how we manage the documents, files, information on the, uh, the, the learning management system like Canvas. So, uh, you know, like us, I think uh, our regular setting for Canvas is we have different modules for every week. And under every week we have a you know, section for plenary. So we put something related to the plenary under the category of plenary. And then we have the tutorials, we have TBLs uh, discussions. And also we are able to add like a quizzes or you know, discussions or pages something also under the category. So I think the students can be easily find these uh, useful materials. And also sometimes, um, I think once you have created a message or something there, you can also add it in the student's to-do list. 
So, so that's why you know because I I don't want to send lots of announcements because you know once you send lots of announcement, then students you know they they just found maybe they don't want to read it or they will ignore it. I only send a very important you know <laughs> announcement <laughs> through the system, but uh, other kind of the like explanations or guide or something, I put it in the discussion or like a piazza or or, or you know like a pages. And also, I added this to the students' to-do list. So just like a students will, will will see what to do in uh, on their calendar, and I I think it is more natural for them to do. Yeah, thanks. Great, thanks, Singa. I think this really shows we did have a lot of achievements, especially overall with our learning management system, Canvas. We were very fortunate yeah. that we already had that in place. We were already using it quite a bit to structure our modules and our courses and provide resources. I think Hanoku was saying about they already submitted their assessments and all their assignments through that. So we really had a lot of good things in place that we were very fortunate. So that was good. You can tell Singa is our analytics guy and that he loves the numbers and going into the back end yeah. of Canvas canvas and seeing all those analytics and who's opening things you can yes. definitely tell he's our quantitative guy in our team for <laughs> <laughs> so we did touch on a few of the challenges but i do want to finish with really what we felt was our final theme of our reflections and so i do want the panel to just share a few more of the challenges that maybe we haven't talked about yet and then I'll summarize a little bit with our overall lessons learned that we've alluded to a little bit. So Deepika, did you wanna talk about a few of those challenges for us? Um, yes, Patricia, quite quickly, um, reflecting back, I would say that although there were a lot of opportunities for them to interact with the teaching staff, what was missing was the interaction with their classmates I did use a lot of breakout rooms, but in those breakout rooms, um, I mean, because they did not have the cameras on, so not everybody was participating. Um, retrospectively, I could have perhaps um, incorporated that into the design. We are somehow perhaps using some peer learning or something else they could have interacted with their classmates more. What we did was we asked the students to answer tutorial questions on scenarios before the tutorial started. And then we used the tutorial time to provide feedback, which means, which I mean, in an ordinarily in an in-person class, they would have been um, engaging with those scenarios in the class. So which means they were using outside tutorial time for writing those answers. And um, so perhaps asking them to write answers during tutorial time would have been better rather than them eating into some of their other time. After half of the quarter was over, we started seeing a drop in attendance. They were writing assignments for other papers too. So we could have taken away the tutorial scenarios and perhaps use them for other interactive activities, which would have been a better use of their time or made them into drop-in clinics. And that could have been um, better. And then lastly, apart from our course, they were also zooming in for other courses. So maybe cutting down the two hour TBL would have been better especially in the last few weeks. And um, the novelty of Zoom and the need to see their teachers faded over time. So perhaps having something more different um, in the um, last few weeks in order to pick their energy levels would have been useful. We did not have to use the entire two hour time for TVL. Some of that could have been set aside for something else and reduced um, that time that they spent on Zoom in the last three to four weeks. So um, those are the lessons that I would say that I learned um, from that entire experience. Thank you, Deepika. And Hanuku, what did yeah, you want well, to I add to that? Yeah. I endorse uh, Deepika's uh, um, points that she said about challenges to keep it focused. Um, not have two long sessions. And so um, I learned it by experience in the strategy course. Initially, we had one and a half hours and two hours and two hours. For after first three weeks, students drop were dropping off and, and not just, just there, but not participating at all. Some students were not even coming in the fourth, fifth, sixth weeks. So then we, we actually contacted them and said, we will have only about half an hour uh, discussion and workshop together. After that, I will be available 
but you can actually ask questions or work with other students in the breakout rooms so that you could use it, but we will not disturb you. So it provided a forum for them to work so, so that they can be they engaged in actual class work without our intervention. Uh, otherwise, they may not be able to come together. So the Zoom that we provided facilitated that learning. So that is, uh, so the, in terms of challenge, how to keep them engaged is an important issue. So that there's no one single way or one, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, depending on the course, depending on the teacher, depending on what topic we are covering, we need to customize it. And also credit must be given to students for being so resilient those days. Uh, they really uh, came back and learned. And there are also, just as we see, some students excel on online learning and some students don't excel. They, in fact, they, they face a challenge. So we need to identify who are the people who are not able to learn or who don't feel comfortable learning and provide some extra support for them. So that is a challenge to bring about a good learning experience in the class. Definitely good points. Yeah, I think the fact that most of our students are international as well, I think you brought this up before Hanuku is, you know, they're stressed about the whole situation, staying motivated, they're alone, maybe they're doing teamwork, but they're sitting alone. Yep. And I think that was a really big challenge for them. Mm. Definitely. And Singa, what else did you have to add for some challenges that you saw? Yeah, I, I, I can, because, you know, uh, English is not my uh, first language. So I also being a, like an international student. So that's why I, I think I quite understand their needs uh, because like teaching online, uh, I think one important thing is uh, we probably may the lack of the body language. Like in the classroom teaching, we can use hands or, you know, that, that there are plenty of body language can, you know, assist the students to understand, or I mean, international students to understand uh, the meaning better sometimes. So teaching online sometimes on the screen, you know, like especially when you have the virtual background, sometimes it's going to hide your, you know, hands or something. So I think I found it is quite challenging because um, I, I, I used to have like a kind of feeling like, when you talk somebody like on phone or you know through the screen or something, it is quite difficult for them to understand actually. But but when you when you see the people when you talk to the people in person, I think it will make the communication easier. So that is one of the challenge. And, and, and another one actually, what I can see because for us our next cohort will not come to New Zealand to to do the study or. Oh, unless these, you know, native, I mean, local students already been here. So uh, we have some Chinese students, Indian students, and others, you know, students from all around the world. And they are actually come from different time zones. So, you know, the, the challenge is like uh, when we are in the morning, maybe they are in the late night, or sometimes maybe they are quite tired, or maybe quite easy to lose the uh, attention to, you know, the class. So I found that mm -hmm. that could be something that quite challenging to us. And also when we, we, we have to be very smart to set the deadline for the quizzes for, you know, assessments. Yeah, so I think of these two points. Thanks. Thanks, Singa. Yes, I think that's a really good point. And I think we really overlook the fact that they can't see our emotions. I found that very quickly with my professional development students that they didn't get my terrible jokes on Zoom and I just had to move on that nobody was laughing at my jokes because as English is their second language, sometimes the jokes don't always come across that well in person, let alone on Zoom. So I did learn that it was quite a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I see we only have a couple of minutes left. I do want to see if there's any other questions out there that haven't been answered yet before I briefly talk about our concluding remarks. So anyone want to unmute, have any questions that they'd like to pose to the panel before we start wrapping up today? or if they want to share any other experience that we have not covered. I think I might um, jump in there in that case, everyone. Um, my name Thank is you, Jess Jessica. And, um, I'm from the University of New South Wales, Sydney. Um, I'm maybe just share my point on Angela's first um, or second question about um, how to engage um, students online, especially first year undergrad students. And um, my experience of teaching 
um, in the last um, semester was I think we've got to invest in quite a lot of time in terms of the social aspects of it for first year undergrad students. So particularly for me, I, I did about three classes and I kind of experimented as, as we all. So I did one of my classes where I really spent the first, almost the whole tutorial just for them to introduce themselves, um, get to know each other. And that took up the whole tutorial. And then the last um, two or three um, tutorials, I kind of just um, went on and did, um, you know, very brief intros, just went straight into it. And I found that the first tutorial that I did with a lot more introductions, a lot more of that time investing in socializing mm -hmm. was um, working a lot better to, for undergrad first year students. So mm -hmm. um, that's just my two cents, I guess, in um, trying to motivate and engage first year mm -hmm. undergrad students, which is always a challenge, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and what I heard from my first year undergrads that I had last year was they felt like they missed out on the experience that everyone before them was able to experience when they talked to other people and said, oh, my first year was amazing. And we did all this team-based learning. And a lot of them said they feel like they missed out on that. So I think that social aspect was so important for them. And unfortunately for my ones that we were teaching on a team, so we usually have about 1800 students in that undergrad course broke up into nine or 10 streams. And unfortunately converting it all very quickly and some of those things we didn't realize until it was maybe a bit too late. So that was really good that you did that at the beginning. I would definitely do it differently the next time around. Hopefully not in lockdown, but it just delivered online in general to them was a very different experience. Yeah, thank you for that. And Steve, did you have something you wanted to add for us? Um, yeah. Thanks, I, Jess. I first off apologize for wearing green with a green screen behind me. I look like Thanos snapped his fingers recently. Um, but I was wondering for those of you who have MBA students, our MBA program uh, is completely online. So for us, it wasn't necessarily a challenge to change the methods or change um, you know, the, the tools that we were using for the MBA program, but to what extent did you find you needed to attend to sort of the social needs of the students, right? As they were dealing with a pandemic and its impact on their jobs, their families, et cetera, that was something that uh, I think some of our faculty did really well and other faculty didn't necessarily think about because, well, we're already online. They've already got that taken care of. So did, did those social needs come up you know, I know we have some HR people in here. HR would be type of people, right? It's like that kind of place, um, as opposed to merely the function. I'm sorry, I'm at Walsh University in North Canton, Ohio. So good morning to many of you. Good evening to me. Well, I'm a University of Michigan fan, so I don't know about all of this Ohio talk, but it, within our department of the Graduate School of Management, we do have an MBA program as well that is fully on campus. So they made that conversion as well. So in talking with some of my colleagues and particularly my supervisor who teaches in the MBA program, she found that they were disappearing, that they were completely ghosting out of what was happening, disengaging. So they were quite worried with our MBA students that they were no longer engaged at all. And I think you're right. It was a lot of anxiety around what was happening in the industries, what was happening with their jobs. They were getting a lot of pressure. Everyone was switching to remote working at the same time as we were switching to online learning for them. And so they did see quite a dramatic shift in our MBA program that the students had more unique challenges than even our students did who had kind of more that isolation ours had that extra component of they have their careers that they're in and they have other concerns so i don't know if anybody else has any mba experience that they want to share or any other things to add to that but i think Stephen, that's a really good point that they had different concerns than our I'm other generally students. the least socially aware when it comes to my preferences, social is not at the top of the list. I'm not a people person, which is ironic in my field, obviously. Uh, but, you know, this was a time where, it, I don't know, it like snapped to me. But for both my undergrads and graduates, that this isn't just a techn technological shift for them. I guess I would add to that. We saw our students, you know, now not only was their social aspect taken away from work and because they were working at home, but now suddenly they were becoming teachers to their kids. 
Mm. And so the time, the time constraints and the, that they had just, it didn't double or it probably quadrupled. Mm. I mean, many exponentially. So we found that. Definitely, Carol. I think that's a good point. And Singer mentioned that earlier as well. He has his lovely twins that he had his whiteboard and was teaching for us all day and then teaching them all night, I assume. So yeah, definitely balancing that was something that was quite unique, especially to our MBA students. Kind of stereotyping, generally our business master students don't have children, but there are a few exceptions to that. But I think definitely in our MBA cohorts, they felt that a bit more as well as our teaching staff. Yeah, mm. I think that's a really good point, that work-life balance. And Angela, did you have something you wanted to share with us? Yeah, I think one of the things that we struggled with, particularly in semester one last year, was the university's response to what was going on. Um, I'm not sure if your institutions had the same kind of thing, but we, we hit lockdown one week uh, in week five, and normally after week six, we go on break. So they decided to extend break week for a month. So rather than a two-week break, they had a month's break, and that's where I think we lost a lot of people along the way. It was too long. Students wanted work to do. Macy said we couldn't give any students any work. Um, so we weren't allowed to add new materials. We weren't allowed to keep a group coming. And we knew that some students would have had a lot of time at home during lockdown when they weren't working and then have a lot of pressure when they went back to work after lockdown and they wanted to get ahead and they couldn't because Massey prevented us from adding new materials. So we lost quite a bit of time there and students kept saying, can, can you just give me something? I'm, you know, I've got nothing to do. I'm at home. We're like, no, sorry, we can't. Mm. Um, so we sort of kind of had like a two week window that was there. The other institutional challenge was that they decided in their wisdom to give year long extensions on assignments that weren't submitted in semester one. Um, mm. So they, didn't, they took away all the structure, they took away the compulsory activities, they took away anything that kind of keeps students engaged. Um, and of course, you know, semester two came in, still had assignments from semester one outstanding, they never got done because they were focusing on semester two. So we've got students that we're still chasing up to finish last year's work. Um, so there's kind of institutional decisions as a response to being so flexible um, that taking away all of that structure um, really impacted on, on way students engage. So I'm not sure if your institutions did similar things um, to try and help students, um, which we certainly felt didn't help us as teachers or the MS students. Yeah, we, I don't know if your institutions did this, but we actually allowed students to change their grade from like a grade to a pass, no credit, a week after the semester ended. So that is ultimate flexibility. That would prevent some very interesting challenges to bring that in. I was going to add along those same lines, Carol, that our university in semester one last year decided to do an across the board grade bump for all students. So if students had an A minus, they bumped to an A, B plus, A minus, and bumped, bumped along. Well, then what happened is we had another lockdown during semester two, but the university decided not to grant that grade bump when actually the second lockdown was quite a bit more disruptive, I would argue, to the semester system. Hmm. And they did not grant that grade bump and students were quite angry about that, that they didn't get that additional. But then the other argument of it was some people came to me and said, well, you've given them this grade bump in semester one. So now when I hire them, I know that they were there and they didn't get an A, they got a B or they didn't get a C, they got a B. And so it's sort of creating this really strange discussion as well as then going on that they're still arguing that they should have received it in semester two as well. So I'm glad we're not the only ones. <laughs> yeah, we were slightly different. We did average. So if the course average was the same, we, we didn't change it. If it was higher or lower, we adjusted. But of course, the trouble was we had a whole lot of really good students doing worse because they were at home with kids working. And we had a lot of our students who normally wouldn't have done so well at home with nothing else to do and increase. So the average didn't change. But certainly the students who were affected by it did. And we had lots of complaints about, I'm normally a better student than this. I can normally do better. I didn't have time. Um, and so that was, yeah, that was a real challenge too, that going on an average didn't make any sense in the context we were working in. 
Yes, very interesting and very creative solutions. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Great questions and great discussion. So I do want to wrap up as I know we're running out of time. So I'm just going to share a couple of visuals with you quickly, just so that I can have a little bit of a discussion about what the panel felt were some lessons that we took away from all of this. And so if my Zoom cooperates, which is always a fun thing, I will one of these days figure this out, right? So I'm just going to project this up for us. So this is actually something that Deepika created and we think is wonderful. So we want to share with you as well for a bit of final discussion. So sorry about that. We have to love Zoom. So just five things that we felt were really lessons that we learned and some takeaways for us that we wanted to share with you. So one of the main things we've touched on a little bit is that Zoom fatigue idea. And I'm sure all of you have felt this, all of us have felt it, all of our students have, that we had a lot of recorded lectures trying to utilize that actual lecture time for things like question and answer rather than just lecturing at them over Zoom. And so things like discussions within our learning system, collaborative tools such as Google Docs, we've touched on a lot of this, shorter Zoom sessions. Deepika mentioned that, that we quickly learned that perhaps keeping students on Zoom for two or three hours was not practical or something that they wanted to be doing. Also offering those breaks, we touched on that, having some breaks for them and mixing Zoom with some of those asynchronous sessions as well. And so thinking about some of the innovative activities in those last few weeks, because like we acknowledged, those last few weeks, energy got very low, attendance was low. So thinking about in the future, we would use some interesting activities, maybe some games, creative use of that lecture and tutorial time. And Deepika mentioned as well, maybe bringing in guest speakers, industry people is very important to our students. That might be something we would put towards the end to enable that. So that third point is really limiting interaction with the classmates was an issue. So we would probably use more of the breakout rooms, more of the tools for discussion for them. I utilized some peer review and peer evaluation, which I think was really helpful for them to engage with their classmates. Granted, when you add some marks or some grades to that, it does encourage them to do it, which I'm not always a fan of, but I acknowledge that that may be how they run. And so I felt like it did engage them more with their class rates if they knew they were being evaluated or potentially reviewed for a mark with their peers. And also we've touched on a lot of the social aspects and our students took it upon themselves actually to just start creating WhatsApp groups and having discussions outside and creating kind of cohort social discussion groups just to really keep that engagement and enable them to have some interaction with each other. And the other one is really thinking of their time management. We've talked about this a little bit and providing them with weekly checklists was something that myself and a couple of other lectures did trial. And like Singha said, offering that to-do list for them. We feel like using more of that in the future. Again, we only had a couple of days when we got, went into the first lockdown. So we feel like we learned a lot about what we would do differently. And if we had time to plan these out online, how we would do it. And like we said, our new cohort potentially this year is coming in online only and they'll be coming from all over the world which presents other challenges but since we know that we can kind of implement some of the things we've learned and so looking at building in that assessment time like Deepika mentioned maybe we're doing some of that in our time instead of having all of that kind of face-to-face -face time and then how we're planning our courses is also very important and so that fifth point is really just the pressure of assignments picked up after mid quarter. So we felt like this really went along with their time management, offering those other activities that we needed to think through how we alleviate some of that pressure, whether that's across, if multiple people are teaching those courses, how we balance that for them. And so just thinking about that. So those are really the five major lessons learned from us. And so we do want to thank you for attending today. It's been wonderful having you. And I just want to see if there's anything else our panelists want to add quickly before we bring this to a close. Ten minutes late. I apologize. Brandon's going to get the cane out and pull me off stage pretty soon. Uh, just thank you to everyone for participating, for um, hearing our side of experiences and adding your own experiences to this discussion. Yeah, thank you. 
um, for coming to the session and uh, listening to our our experience and also sharing some of your experiences. And I feel that uh, it's going to be a new norm. And it's a new norm. There'll be more of ICT use, more of online, even if you go back to regular classes. So that is where the shift is clearly seen, uh, and it's going to be the normal uh, way of teaching in future. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yes, thank you, Deepika Hanuk and Singh. It was really great to talk with you and have this panel. And thank you to all of our participants. It was wonderful to field your questions. We definitely wanted this to be an interactive session. So thank you very much. And we enjoyed sharing our reflections with you. And hopefully it's helpful in our new world and what we're teaching in the future. So thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.